he's hoping, as are all the Mercedes, that they can fight for race wins, maybe even by the end of this year, but certainly by the start of next year. You know exactly what every single player on a roster is making, so I find that a little bit odd that Formula One, it's not common knowledge or knowledge that is put out. Two years and some change, that's how much time it really takes to start getting a team moving in the right direction in preparation for something like that. The Lewis Hamilton has 103 pole positions more than any other driver in the sport by some margin. Welcome to Unlapped, Katie George alongside Lawrence Edmondson. No Nate Saunders, he is fast at work in Montreal as we speak. Apparently he's going to be on SportsCenter with Daniel Ricciardo. So bigger and better things, would you say, Lawrence? You ditched just a week ago, now he's ditching us this week. Yeah, I feel like he has a proper excuse. He has Daniel Ricciardo in the paddock in Montreal. I just had a few media briefings that <laughs> I had to get to and couldn't get out of. So yeah, that's pretty good. I'm looking forward to see what he says, of course, Sam. Um, We've got Dan Ricardo doing the old cast this weekend uh, on on Sunday for the Canadian Grand Prix. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he's he's up to, and Daniel's story as well. This whole season, it's always evolving, isn't it? It's always kind of like, is he going to be in the seat next year? What's right. going on at Red Bull behind closed doors with Checo Perez? So hopefully, Nate will find all of that out for us, and next time we talk to him, he'll have all the secrets to tell us. The Manning cast, which is a simulcast to Monday Night Football, has been a huge success. People really like the simulcast, a different option of viewing. If you were to rate, project how Daniel Ricardo is going to do in his TV pundit debut, if you will, and obviously this is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to seeing, what would you project the rating to be 1 to 10, 10 being knocks it out of the park? I mean... I'm not just saying this because I'm an employee, but I actually think it's going to be really good. Uh, I, I'm going to say for this first one, 9.2, with okay. the expectation that he's nearing a 10 by the Las Vegas Grand Prix, which is the third and final one. There's also Austin. So no, I think it's going to be great. I and mean, this is a perfect environment for it. Um, with Will Arnett, from my understanding, kind of they're not actually sat on a couch together. Will Arnett is, is doing it remotely, <laughs> but basically okay. sat around watching a race as if it's with your mates. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo, every time I've met him, he's made me feel like I'm one of his mates, even though I'm not. Um, so he's just got that kind of personality that I think will make it like just brilliant viewing. Um, of course, you can watch it the normal way, but um, I am very keen uh, if I can set up a system where I can listen into it. I'm definitely going to be listening. I was curious uh, how you would watch it, because obviously you're going to be writing a ton alongside Nate after the Canadian Grand Prix. So how you would try to kind of intake both pieces of content. So th I think that's a fair way. I'm going to have split screens. I'm going to try the split screens and see how it goes. Yeah, I need like three of me really for this weekend. But um, <laughs> usually actually in the media center, we don't have any commentary at all. So um, we're kind of sat there. We've got lots of timing screens. Uh, I usually have a separate timing screen running on my phone and then uh, different bits on, on my computer where I'm typing things up. And uh, between all of it and a few snarky comments in the media center, that's how I usually <laughs> consume a race. So it's actually quite nice for me when I'm not at a race just to watch it on TV and get the normal commentary, let alone Daniel Ricciardo. So yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a good experience this weekend. I actually found that interesting when I popped up to see you guys at the last two Miami Grand Prix. You hear radio messages, correct? But that's the that's right. only audio you hear from the actual race in the press box. Why is that? Do you guys prefer it that way? Is it a choice? Yeah, I, I think it's probably, I mean, it's always been like that as long as I've been working in F1. And when I first went into a press room, I was so surprised. I thought, well, where's, you know, where's the commentary? It was back then, I think it was pre-David Croft even, but, you know, I need somebody kind of like just giving me hints of what's going on. But you soon get used to it. And I think when you're dialed into all sorts of things, remember lots of people in the media center have different jobs, different ways of approaching it. You'll have some people uh, who will watch um, they use F1 TV just to watch their driver. So, uh, for example, we have a Chinese journalist in the uh, in the media center called Frankie, and he just watch, uh, watches Joe Guan Yu on his F1 TV, and he gets all of the team radio for that. So every single little bit of team radio that goes through, he gets that. Because when he's writing his stories at the end of the day, a lot of it is going to be focused on Joe. Of course, he'll sure. write around the rest of it, but he really needs to know what, what happens. So I think because you've got everybody focusing on different things and, you know, there's a lot of people in the media center who like to think they know better than the commentators as well. So um, I think it's probably just to <laughs> keep everyone sane as we as we go along. Uh, and it's by then it's the end of the weekend, right? So you need to kind of concentrate as well. So, yeah. We'll but, leave but, it there yeah. so we don't name names of who that could possibly <laughs> be. All right, let's dive into some of the headlines before we give you a race preview. Take it for a grain of salt. We are full disclosure recording this on a Wednesday early afternoon. So you could be listening to this and we have confirmation that Lewis Hamilton has in fact signed an extension with Mercedes. But as of right now, a Spanish publication um, has written a piece that it is rumored that he has signed that said extension. It involves 
a one-year guaranteed deal plus a one-year option. It also alleges in the said rumored piece that he has taken a pay cut, um, which I find fairly fascinating. I really want to see if that comes to fruition. If that is the parameters and the Spanish publication has gotten everything right, they also say that they expect it to be announced during the Canadian Grand Prix weekend, so soon in the coming days. Would you be surprised if that's the parameters, Lawrence, of Lewis Hamilton's deal moving forward? A little bit, yeah. Uh, the announced at the Canadian Grand Prix bit, not so much, because mm -hmm. uh, Toto Wolff was uh, speaking to CNBC, I think, earlier this weekend and saying that they've been having meetings since Spain. We knew already there was going to be a meeting on the Monday after the Spanish Grand Prix, and it sounds like they've had a few more and they've made progress, and now it's really just getting down to those numbers. Um, but the one plus one, I'm a little bit surprised at. I mean, you can frame that two ways. If Mercedes want to, they can probably say multi-year deal with an option or something like that. It's it's rare that we get um, exact numbers in any sense. Sometimes we do get the length of the contract uh, put out with, say, you know, two year, three year, sometimes even five year uh, contracts we've seen fairly recently between drivers and teams. But sometimes I'll just say multi-year, which means more than one, but could be two, could be maybe even one and an option. You never know because the options kind of get um, exercised behind closed doors as well. Um, the thing I find hard to believe is that there'd be some kind of pay cut. Mm. But you never know. I mean, it's um, it's a tricky one. And also, I think with Lewis and Mercedes, it's so much more than just this standard driver contract now. It goes into what happens when he retires, um, the ambassadorial role that he said he wants to continue to have with Mercedes, um, the uh, various charities and funds they've set up to try and improve diversity in the sport. Mm -hmm. All of these are considered uh, between Hamilton and Mercedes long-term projects. So to think that, you know, they're at the point where they're kind of really knocking each other back and having these hard negotiations, it's, yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I, I think there's there's a lot of desire from both sides to make this a long-term thing. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, we will never find out whether he's taken a pay cut or not. We don't know for certain exactly how much he's on right now. The rumours are anywhere between 40 and $50 million a year. Um, but then you have, like, promotional stuff on top and, you know, extra added uh, personal deals. So... We don't really know, and I don't think we'll ever find out whether this contract was a step backwards or not in that regard. So any journalist speculating on that is on pretty safe territory because, you know, the team will never confirm or deny it because they don't want to give any hint of which way it's gone. Um, but in, in terms of the length, uh, I was probably more expecting a two plus one, so two guaranteed mm -hmm. years plus a um, plus a uh, potential third year um but yeah this report suggests one plus one which i suppose is possible but lewis has said a number of times recently uh he doesn't want to just add an extra year onto his contract now he wants to be there for several years because i think he still sees it as a multi-year project to get sure. mercedes back into championship winning ways he's hoping as are all of mercedes that they can fight for race wins maybe even by the end of this year but certainly by the start of next year but that doesn't mean you're winning championships straight away mm -hmm. you know if you're just taking the odd victory here or there so I'll be a bit surprised if it's just one confirmed year. But yeah, we'll wait and see. And by the time our good listeners uh, listen to this <laughs> conversation, they may already know the answer. But um, yeah, they might. That's, just, that's just the way it goes sometimes. A couple of follow-ups. Has that always been the way in Formula One that you don't know exactly the salary that somebody is on? I, I liken it to American sports where with salary caps, which Formula One now essentially has, you know exactly what every single player on a roster is making. So I find that a little bit odd that Formula One, it's not, common knowledge or knowledge that is put out yeah frustratingly um it's all speculation i think by the time you kind of amalgamate everybody's numbers all the journalists that do it i've sat next to journalists and i won't name names here but they <laughs> they literally pluck a number out of the air and then just type it into their their keyboard and um and then of course you can go to the pr person and say well is it 40 million dollars and again they're not going to save away so you know you write it and then if they have a problem with it, you're like well tell me what it is and then sure. they need to do. um but yeah the, it's not quite the same as US sports because remember the drivers are not in the budget cap so um in fact the teams don't really have to declare um apart from to the fia of course they do but they don't have to declare publicly where their money's going in the budget cap anyway um mm -hmm. we had a bit of that with red bull last year but only because uh they broke they the were audited in exactly they were audited and uh and it was important for the transparency of the regulations that it was clear where they'd overspent and what those overspends were um but the driver contracts are not part of that at the moment there there was a lot of talk 
uh, not so long ago about including driver contracts in the budget cap or having a separate budget cap for driver contracts. And you'll notice at that time, a lot of drivers, including Max Staff and Charles Clerk, signed very long contracts because <laughs> they wanted to guarantee that the market value they had now, unrestricted, uh, sat there for a number of years. Um, but that kind of rumor and suggestion of a of a driver budget cap seems to have gone away just because uh, the budget cap, which is really on the technical side, the building of the cars, the racing of the cars, has been so successful in managing costs and allowing teams to operate kind of successfully that there's you know a question as to whether we really need to bring the drivers into it. But I would love a rule. If, if it was just like a kind of halfway house, let's have a rule where the drivers, <laughs> we have to know what they're on because it's fascinating, isn't it? It is. And, um, you know, and then to compare across sports as well would be very interesting, but um, we're not quite there yet. But we have these rough numbers. As I said, like Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton, both rumored to be on somewhere between 40, $50 million a year yeah. um, on uh, some very long contracts in, in Max's case. And Lewis's one, of course, gets renewed. Seems every two years or so. He did a one year one a while back. But every time you renew it, uh, from Lewis's point of view, he'll be hoping that number goes up. Of course, sure. this report suggests maybe it's going down. But yeah, there you go. When it comes to that plus one year, the option year, how does that play out? And what could the possible stipulations be? Is that up to Lewis? Is that up to Mercedes? Is it up to both? Are there parameters set for that option year to automatically renew or not? How does that work? Yeah, so it's essentially a get out clause. Um, and uh, sometimes that's on both sides. Sometimes it's on one side. If you remember the Daniel Ricciardo saga with McLaren, it was only on Daniel's side and they had to kind of uh, move to, basically pay, to, to pay Daniel out. And so um, so that does happen as, as well. Um, it's sometimes related to performance. So if a driver is at a team and that team is not at the front of the grid, not winning races, but they feel they are a race winning driver, they may set, a um some kind of clause that says they have to score x amount of points by this part of the season to prove that the team is going in the right direction if that isn't there then an exit clause can open up and they could potentially find a way out um again all this stuff where you only ever hear the rumors about uh, often you hear when it breaks down is when you find out what some of these exit clauses are um but if everything goes well and the option gets taken up it's very rare that that, that you hear about it in fact we we there were some reports from uh, Sky Sports, Craig Slater, who's uh, a very good journalist there, uh, reporting that George Russell behind the scenes, while everyone is looking at Lewis Hamilton, has just signed uh, an extra option year on his contract to take him through to the end of 2025. Um, so there's an example of where one um, was in a contract. We didn't even know it was in the contract, really, unless you're you know, unless you you know, very close to the Russell camp. And yet it looks like it's been uh, taken up already and he's likely to be there for 25. But, you know, from Russell's perspective, you think how young he is in his career, um, how much potential we know the Mercedes team have and how blocked off uh, Red Bull is by having Max Verstappen there. Why wouldn't he take up that option at this stage and stay until the end of 25? So, um, yeah, that's another interesting little one to probe into this weekend for the journalists on the ground. Remember, we disclosed up front that this was a Wednesday afternoon recording. So if you're listening to this and you're like, ah, I already know this news, it's a done deal. That's because we don't have the information confirmed as of right now. We hope to throughout the weekend. And of course, Nate is on the ground right now as we speak. Something that's um, caught a lot of buzz on the internet. Um, the F1 2023 video game driver ratings were revealed. And I think some people have some issues with what they see. Here's how it currently stands. Max Verstappen has the highest rating at 94. I don't know if they view it as Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso tied for second, but on the grid, on the graphic that is presented online on Twitter, you can go look it up. Fernando Alonso is ahead of Lewis Hamilton, but both have a driver's rating at 92, followed by Charles Leclerc in fourth, Lando Norris fifth, Sergio Perez sixth, Carlos Sainz seventh, George Russell eighth, Valtteri Bottas ninth, and Esteban Ocon 10th. Before, Lawrence, I get your initial thoughts on said ratings. Zach, you've got a good pulse on uh, what's going down on the internet. What are some of the reactions we've seen thus far? Yeah, it seems as though um, your analysis of, you know, Alonzo and Hamilton being tied right there for second, that is, seems to be a lot of buzz. A lot of people think Lewis should be a tad higher, which I probably would agree with. And then, uh, in terms of the two Ferrari drivers, they could be a little low. Again, not sure if the F1 game is kind of looking more at just this season specifically. Uh, and George Russell coming in at the 88. I mean, he, you know, last year he had a, a great season almost compared to his own teammate in Lewis Hamilton. So uh, 
that is the major rift. And then again, some people at the bottom, uh, the bottom 10 of the of the grid, uh, Alex Albon coming in at an 83. I think some people think he's a much more talented driver than uh, what the game is. But overall, you know, sometimes year to year, they go a little crazy with these ratings. But I think this year it's it's not too bad. But yeah, some some people okay. have a little bit of gripes with some of the ratings. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you for the analysis. Four categories are considered experience, racecraft, awareness, and pace. Your thoughts, Lawrence Edmondson? Well, I'd like to start by saying that I rate the drivers at the end of every season, and it is based <laughs> purely on that season. And the amount of, uh, how shall I phrase this? Um, <laughs> the, the amount of anger it seems to create online uh, is quite remarkable. Um, and, you know, I, I also try and justify it with um, a couple of hundred words or so per driver. I'm not sure how many people actually read that, but um, yeah, <laughs> either way, it's not an easy task. Having said that, I do tend to disagree with uh, with a few bits of this. Um, really, for me, George Russell, down as seventh on this rating, tied with Carlos Sainz, uh, seems seems a bit low to me. Uh, I would put him right up there. I, I think in F1, you have five top-tier drivers. Uh, Max Verstappen, Fernando Alonso, Lewis Hamilton, Charles Leclerc, and George Russell. Lando mm -hmm. Norris, potentially, he is in their top five, potentially. But I think because he's never been in um, a very front-running car, of course, hasn't won a race yet, uh, had a chance to win a race in Russia a few years back, messed up. You know, there's there's a, there's enough question marks that he's potentially in that top five, but we're not quite sure. And then uh, the rest are incredibly good racing drivers, but I just don't think they're in that quite top tier uh, level. So, yeah, and then you, you dig into the details a little bit more and you've got um, this pace rating, which I guess is the one which basically suggests how fast they are around a single lap. Max Verstappen has 95. Fair enough. He's a very, very fast driver. But in comparison, Lewis Hamilton has 90. I'd like to remind you that Lewis Hamilton has 103 pole positions more than any other driver in the sport by some margin. And down on 90. And then Charles Leclerc, who is uh, in the sport, certainly considered one of the best qualifiers um, on the current grid, if not the best, just because of what he can pull out over a single lap, also on 90 which puts them both behind Fernando Alonso on 93 and Max Verstappen on 95. Um, and also George Russell, who's on 91. So yeah, there, there's lots of little bits and you can get so stuck into it, can't you? And like, you can get into this detail. It is, I guess, a bit of fun and it's necessary so that the computer game functions and these drivers <laughs> have some kind of rating. Um, but the other one, which always seems to really upset people is the awareness rating, mainly because I think no one's quite sure what it means. And Valtteri Bottas is by far the most aware driver on the Formula 1 grid for what... Which, what, what is a definition of that, real quick, for those who don't so know? I, yeah, I, I did Me. look it up. And it, it was something vague about uh, ability to stay out of the steward's office. So um, if you're oh, kind of okay. in a racing incident, you don't kind of cause an accident and get hit by the stewards with a penalty. I guess maybe it's a little bit about awareness of strategy as well. That's that's how I would see awareness. So, um, But then someone like Fernando Alonso, who is incredibly aware about what's going on in a race. You know, we've seen him multiple times this year, pick something out on a TV screen, comment on it, say, oh, what a wonderful overtake Lance did or whatever. And he's got an awareness of 78. So I don't know what it means. Uh, but I think the other problem here is that if they put Alonso's awareness rating any higher, he'd just be the best driver in of all time. So, which some people claim he is. So I don't know. I mean, Katie, what do you think? You know, I mean, you you, you, you watch these drivers week in, week out. You, you know where they're good, where they're not. What do you disagree with? What do you agree with? I think it's fascinating when you kind of dive into the four categories. You mentioned Lando Norris, right? Being maybe we're on the outside of that top five driver um, scale at the moment. His pace is 91. You mentioned Max Verstappen being at 95, Fernando Alonso 93, but he and George Russell pace-wise are tied behind those two guys at 91, where Lewis and Charles are at 90. He's well ahead of Sergio Perez, who's at 87 from a pace standpoint. I don't know. I think when you start looking at the four numbers below, that's when you can really start having arguments um, over this. I agree with you. George Russell is entirely too low. Um, I would love to know, Zach, if you don't mind looking this up while we move on, what Pierre Gasly's awareness rating is. <laughs> because as we know, the man likes to pick up penalties here and there. Yeah, um, his, his is a 76 awareness rating. One of the, one of the lowest in the game. <laughs> is that the lowest in the game? You got Joe Guan Yu at seventy four, Logan Sargent seventy five, Nick DeVries seventy five. So amongst amongst the veteran drivers, yes, it's the yeah. lowest. 
Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think Zach, you brought up a good point earlier. Like, are you just doing this based on a very wide lens look at the drivers as of late? Or are you looking totally in this season, the seven, eight races that we, we have seen thus far? Um, I don't know. I don't play the game. I downloaded it. I played it once and I just ended up in the barriers like left, right, left, right. And I ended up getting very frustrating. They call it rage quitting Lawrence. And I think that was my first rage quit ever. So I don't, I don't envision going back to it. What would what, what your overall rating be? Do you think considering most of these drivers are in eighties, nineties, you would be on the game, on the game, um, negative three. Wow. Okay. Can you go okay. in the negatives? I don't know if I, if I hit single digits, I think that would be a win. That would be a victory for me. I mean, I yeah. couldn't keep oh, it on track. I'm not kidding. I found it <laughs> very difficult. It is incredibly difficult. I, I've had a go as well. Like I feel like, you know, I've done a bit go-karting and all that kind of stuff. Like yeah. I can get around a racetrack, but then on the game is it's a different, different world. Um, I mean, I'm only going to apply to me, but I think it's because I'm of a slightly older generation. I used to play, I used to play Gran Turismo with a, with a, kind of yeah. pad you know a, yeah. a gaming pad but not a not a steering wheel so i think nowadays the whole game has moved on and uh yeah so sadly I'll, I'll i'll never be a, a 99 experience like fernando and alonso <laughs> or, or 97 racecraft like max Verstappen. that's becoming a I movie like by the way did you see that I have no I idea who's not. producing it or who's created it but plug nonetheless gran turismo is a movie it's coming out oh that's cool yeah very cool give it a look give it a look all right, a couple other things before we hit our preview. Um, so movement um, and some of the most powerful and most important jobs on teams. We've seen a couple dominoes over the last few weeks, but James Key, who's formerly with McLaren, he's heading to Alfa Romeo uh, as our new technical director starting on September 1st. Could you just tell our audience who James Key is and, and what a move like this does for McLaren and Alfa Romeo? Yeah, well, of course, he was the, um, the technical director at McLaren. Prior to that, he was at uh, uh, Toro Rosso. He's been at Sauber before. I think he did a couple of years of Sauber um, as a technical director. So he actually knows the Alfa Romeo Sauber team quite well. Um, so I guess that is part of the reason he's going back. Although I suspect the main reason is uh, Andreas Seidel, who was the boss at McLaren, uh, moved over to Alfa Romeo at the start of this year. Um, obviously, has a good relationship with Key, values him, believes he will fit into uh, the Sauber Alfa Romeo system fairly well. Um, they did have a technical director called Yann Monchot, and we don't know exactly how he fits into this yet or whether he too is moving on, which is possible as well. Because remember, uh, he was there in 2019, I think was when he first joined, um, and uh, will have a close relationship with Fred Vasseur at Ferrari. So I'm not saying he's going to Ferrari because we don't know yet, but you, know, you could see a situation where perhaps he was also making a move. So until... We find out what's happened to Yann Monchot and where he plans to go or whether he's going to take a chief technical officer role or something like that at Alfa Romeo. Um, it's hard to know exactly how how James Key's uh, movement has come in. But I think it's great because the Key it became clear, I think, wasn't really suited to McLaren and the way that team was going. Um, I think perhaps there was a bit of a culture clash between where the team wanted to go and, and how he wanted to run it. But um, under Andreas Seidel, I think he's, there's two kind of very kindred spirits there. And of course, what we've got to remember, every time we talk about Alfa Romeo at the moment, what we're actually talking about is the Sauber team. And that Sauber team is going to morph into the Audi team in 2026. Right. So um, it's very important that they get the right people in the right positions now. In fact, you know, really, they, they want them there already. And the other thing to note about that is that Sauber is a relatively small team in Formula One at the moment. Now, when Audi comes in, uh, they're going to have their own engine department and they're going to plan to fight the likes of Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes, Aston Martin at the very front of the grid. So they're doing a huge amount of investment, uh, not only in um, in the factory, but also in, in the people and the headcount. And it's important that uh, the technical director they expect to have long term, so James Key in this instance, gets in there early enough to be able to influence those changes and put together the team that he feels is the best team to go forward under Audi. Because as soon as Audi come in, there's going to be so much more pressure than there is right now uh, under the Salva Alfa Romeo banner. So, um, But I, I think it's good because um, James Key is uh, someone who we often talk to um as the media we, we often get a chance to talk to him and he's one of those engineers who is incredibly good at explaining uh very complicated things to people like me and um i think that's always a sign of of, of a good technical director someone who can um really get to the bottom the the, the very basics of, of of what's happening and explain to 
explain to people and motivate people. And it seemed like uh, some of that got lost along the way at McLaren. And I, again, I think it was more of a cultural thing that he didn't quite fit into. But um, if he's been given lots of confidence and lots of resource uh, by Andreas Seidel in in Alfa Romeo now, which will later become Audi, I think that's an example, a perfect environment, sorry, for him to flourish and really get 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 the most from his talent. And so, I uh, I think it's a good good move around. Um, and then yeah, interested to see where Yaman Show ends up, whether he just gets moved into a slightly higher position in Sauber or a complementary position, or whether he's he's going somewhere else. Do you think that timeline leading up is more and more common, right? So he's going to start in the new role September 1st. So that gives him a couple months and then two years before 2026 and Audi enters. Two years and some change, that's how much time it really takes to start getting a team moving in the right direction in preparation for something like that? I think if you ask any technical director, they'll always say there isn't enough time. <laughs> they would always, they would love to be able to buy more time out of their budget to do stuff. But um, but it is important that there is some run up and it is important that there's uh, some continuity there. So it would be no good, really, if uh, James Key came in 1st of January 2026, mm. because by then a lot of very important decisions would already have been made. We, we know that, um, you know, the next year's car, there, there are already a bunch of important decisions being made at every single team about what's happening next year. In 2026, we have a new engine formula, and we're also expecting uh, a few tweaks to uh, the chassis regulations, the technical regulations. And so um, those aren't quite signed off yet, which is a good thing if you're James Key and uh, and the prospective Audi team, because uh, it gives you that little bit of time to get everything sorted. But there's so much to a Formula One team that needs to be done. Um, James Fowles was talking recently about how bits at Williams, because they've just kind of been... They haven't been upgraded uh, as, as they've gone along. Uh, the processes uh, have become outdated. He said that, you know, it's almost it's, some of it is almost a decade out of outdate. And that's crazy in a Formula 1 team. That's a huge amount of time. So, um, you know, you, you need to kind of start working on all these processes and get them working. And look, a technical director will have an idea of how certain things work, but they will also have to adapt that idea to what they've got at each team. Each team is different. It's uh, its funding structure is different um, and it's it's you know, factory is different and how it goes about manufacturing parts is different. Um, they all kind of converge over time because you do have this movement between teams and there is a best practice undoubtedly because there's teams that go and win championships. But um, but still, you know, all of this stuff needs to be decided upon and the earlier you can do it, the better. So um, yeah, I think uh, September 1st will give James Key a bit of a run up. Um, and uh, I, I guess if, um, you know, they can con- if he can maybe focus on 26 and Yaman show is focusing on, on, on some of the short term stuff. We've seen that before at teams when regulation changes are coming up, they have one big technical guy just on the long term stuff. Another guy looking at short term. We saw at Mercedes that changed recently. Mike Elliott is now on the long term stuff. James Allison is on uh, the short term, getting the car turned around stuff. And really depending on the character of each individual, um, you know, that, that can be a, that can be a big thing because if you're, concentrating on short-term immediate gains and kind of rallying the troops you need to be a big personality who's going to really kind of uh g people up and and get them to ensure that this part makes the car by that um by that race and delivers x amount of performance that's kind of thing james allison's very good at uh perhaps mike elliott wasn't so good at yet mike elliott has these bold and brilliant ideas which could mean that mercedes go into 2026 way ahead so yeah it's you know, it, it's all all of this balancing up. And then, you know, above all of the technical director, you have the team principal and it's their job to make sure the right technical director is in the right place, the right people in the right place, the funding is secure. So much going on. But um, yeah, two, I mean, that's a very long answer to your question, but two years, I think, is is about as, as little as you'd want to leave considering how much how many moving parts there are to turn yeah. a team like Sauber into a team like Audi want to be. It's such an unbelievable operation that I don't think people truly understand at face value until you take us through that. Alf is also rumored to be signing a sponsorship deal with Haas starting in 2024. What could that possibly be about? So those rumors kicked off at the Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, I think there was a meeting, um, but I, it was very much an introductory meeting. It seems like Alfa Romeo, um, which is a brand that they don't really contribute any technical uh aspect to the Formula One team that they're involved with. It's really just a branding exercise. So you get that beautiful Alfa Romeo script across across the side of the car you get you know the the sexy badge on the front 
but um, they don't actually contribute anything like, say, Mercedes does with the technical side or Ferrari does with their technical side. So um, they're able to float between teams quite comfortably and just, you know, put the sticker on. And I think they've had a lot of success from being a part of Formula One. I think, you know, the Alfa Romeo brand is one which has so much history and so much history in racing, outdates Ferrari, um, you know, in, in racing by uh, several decades. In fact, Enzo Ferrari was originally an employee of Alfa Romeo uh, running their racing cars. So um it's it's a brand that uh i think really suits being in top tier motorsport and i think the people at the top of that um which is ultimately stellantis uh which is a, a group that owns a number of, of brands uh, car brands around the world uh realize that so if they can find a way to mix in with Haas, maybe but you know we shouldn't get too far ahead of ourselves because Haas have just signed moneygram as a title sponsor and seem very happy with moneygram so um you know if, if, if there are discussions i think they are very much a preliminary stage and really the emphasis is more on alfa romeo kind of seeing the advantages of being in f1 wanting to stay in f1 than any deal about to be announced in the next few weeks but um as things stand uh just a reminder this is the last year that alfa romeo have with sauber uh before we go through this kind of um Transition. phase with Sauber where I believe they'll be called Sauber again yeah transition phase is definitely the best way to describe it um and then uh they'll start talking about Audi stuff and that will be interesting as well because I think up to now because the Alfa Romeo brand has been there uh Audi have been quite reluctant about talking about their grand plans going forward because it's a almost like a rival car brand on the car once that goes away at the end of this year I think we'll learn a lot more about what Audi have in in store and perhaps a little bit more about what they've done uh to the factory in Switzerland and what they plan to do to make sure they hit the ground running in 2026. I will say I miss the days where Gunther Steiner kneels down to uh toy-like ships for advertisements <laughs> that money gram must be feeling real nice for Gunther Steiner so he can focus on the right things. I think MoneyGram should make more use of that, right? They, they know they that it's up for anything, so they should be like, right, here we go. <laughs> Iconic. Iconic. Uh, we're going racing this weekend, and we obviously cannot wait, so let's dive into uh, a couple of the storylines. First being the weather. Looks like uh, some rain could be in the forecast for the Canadian Grand Prix. Um are we just hoping for bad weather at this point so that it um, could possibly disrupt or thwart Max Verstappen's dominance? Or um, is bad weather certainly something that could make this an interesting race? No, it does feel like that, doesn't it? Um, we had the last two races. So uh, in Monaco, there was the rainstorm midway through and it actually opened up an opportunity for Fernando Alonso. Yeah genuinely to win that race uh which won't happen in most places because even if you get ahead during a rainstorm max verstappen has a very fast car and can get back past you monaco is one of the tracks where it's so hard to pass that he may not have got past he may have i don't know i mean that's the most disappointing thing about that race is that we never found out then in spain we had this threat of rain i remember being on the grid i actually took i took my rain jacket down to the grid it was boiling hot but i took my rain jacket down because there was these huge clouds in the distance uh just over the final corner hovering there and mm -hmm. um some people were so convinced that there was going to be rain that george russell <laughs> read it in saying that there was rain in fact it was sweat in his helmet so yeah um so yeah we, it does feel like we're kind of almost relying on on wet weather to spice things up a bit um the only thing to say about that is that often it's the case that the fastest car is also the fastest car in the wet because <laughs> it has the most downforce it's the most well-balanced car and that's the thing about this red bull is that you know we look at other cars and they seem edgy pointy you know uh, they're tricky to drive on the limit uh the red bull is not tricky to drive on the limit and yet its limit is higher than all the other cars so um if if the rain fell i would still be putting my money on max but okay. um, but it does open up all sorts of opportunities for other teams and um there's potential it's in it's apparently it's in the air for saturday maybe for sunday too if you knew it was going to be a downpour and maybe the red bull wasn't as dominant as it is this season who would you draft as your driver to drive in in wet weather that, that that's a good question um i'd say lewis is is right up there and wet um okay. but max is too i mean i yeah. max is the kind of driver where if he was in a mercedes or an aston martin it started raining you know, and say Fernando and Lewis were driving Red Bulls, you might actually put your money on him. I mean, I remember in uh, what was it Brazil 2016 
where he was just absolutely sensational in, in an inferior Red Bull and beat Nico Rosberg in the dominant Mercedes just because the weather started falling. And he had this insane moment where he held a slide, went right up against the barrier. If you haven't seen it, YouTube oh. it. Max Verstappen slide into Lagos wet weather 2016. Uh, and it was stunning. So um, so Max, funnily enough, is one of the best drivers in the rain. Um, who else? I mean, like all, all the top drivers ha- have it in their, in their locker. Mm-hmm. So Fernando Alonso definitely as well. Um, and really, it's it's about that opportunity as well, making the most of of conditions when they come in. And um, if you're a little bit further back, this is often the case as well. If you're the chasing car, you're wanting wet weather because you're willing to take some risks. Where if, if you're the leading car, you know you really are balancing how many how many risks should I be taking? Because you know is the car uh, gaining on me behind or whatever? And you're so reliant on the engineer to tell you and feed you that information and to find a sensible lap time to be hitting because there's nothing worse. And spinning out of the lead of a race um, in the wet, as Sebastian Vettel will tell you, because he did exactly that in 2011 in Canada, and Jensen Button won on the final lap, um, which was a sensational race. Uh, so hopefully more of that in Canada, but we'll see. If fastest lap is at stake, you best believe, even if it's raining, Max Verstappen is going for it if he's got the lead. I think he's addicted to fastest laps. I think he, it's just, you know, he needs to go and see something he's about that because he's absolutely obsessed with it. <laughs> I mean, I guess when you're at the point where you're winning relatively easy, right? You know, you've got to have something to entertain yourself. And <laughs> that is, I, I mean, I say addicted, it's unfair because it's just a characteristic of every single top racing driver is mm-hmm. that if there's an extra bit of performance on the table or if there's an extra point on the table, they go after it. And that's why they are the best. You know, it's just no doubt. Simple. Yeah, he wouldn't be himself who he is today uh, if he wasn't going for fastest lap, um, much to the chagrin of his team engineers. Um, describe the track and the racing that we normally see, regardless of weather here in Montreal. So it's, it's quite a high speed track. Uh, they'll be going well over 200 miles per hour uh, along the long straights, but then it's got some very slow corners as well. So, um, it's really about getting good traction out of the corners. That means you've got to look after the rear tires and that makes it a very different circuit to the one we just left, left Barcelona, which was all about looking after the front tires, specifically the front left. Now, if you talk to people at Mercedes, um, that's one of their real strengths is that when you've got to look after the front tires, their car is very fast. When you've got to look after the rear tires, not so much. So um, it was, it's was it been said uh, by um, a number of people going into this weekend that this is the real test of the Mercedes upgrades. We saw them make an apparent step um, relative to their fellow kind of best of the rest runners, Ferrari and Aston Martin in Spain. But can they keep that up in, in Canada? That would be a true test. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's a circuit that uh, also creates quite a lot of drama. Um, it's got the potential to uh, create very exciting races. If you go back as far as 2010, there was a incredible race because the tyres started falling apart. No one could manage the tyres. And that actually set in, basically set in stone the way that, F1 expected its tyre suppliers to create tyres going forward. We talk about degradation in races. I know people get a bit bored about it, roll their eyes, yawn a bit, but it does often make exciting racing. And the idea behind creating these tyres that struggle a little bit, that you know start to um, have different performance to the tyres on another car, came from the 2010 Canadian Grand Prix, where we had a fantastic race because no one really knew what their four tyres were doing underneath them at any point. You mentioned Mercedes. If you were talking to a Mercedes fan right now, would you tell them... A, temper your expectations a little bit from what we saw two weeks ago in Spain going into Montreal? Or would you say, B, go ahead and be giddy. They're going to make another step forward here in Montreal. Yeah, I'd I'd definitely go with A, um, temper your expectations a bit. Um, But also be very excited if the car is competitive and Lewis and George are fighting for podiums because then you know the extent of the step forward. So, you know, there's two sides to it. Um, the other thing to keep an eye on is, again, it's a relative game. It's all about how good Ferrari and Aston Martin are. Um, Aston Martin apparently have an upgrade coming to their car this weekend. Fernando Alonso said in Spain, um, we expect to be on the podium at the rest of the races. Of course, Spain wasn't a brilliant race for them. Their mm-hmm. car, it seems is almost like the opposite to the Mercedes. So how I was saying the Mercedes is very good at front limited circuits. The uh, Aston Martin seems very good at rear limited circuits and Canada is definitely a rear limited circuit. So um, Fernando is very keen to get back up there, isn't he? And just prove that his run of podiums at the start of the year wasn't just fluke or other people not performing. Mm-hmm. It's because he is damn good. So um, yeah, we're going to see whether they can deliver on that. Is that a realistic expectation for Aston Martin moving forward, a podium at every single race moving forward? 
I, I don't think so because um I think it underestimates what Ferrari and, and Mercedes can do certainly at different types of track um I think it's it's fair to say that Fernando will score outside of the Red Bull drivers the most podiums over the rest of the season I mean he's done that so far already so yeah. it's quite an easy prediction to make but um I think that's something that we can see going forward but the big question with this Aston Martin has been from the start of the year Look, they made a great start. They made great progress over the winter, but can they sustain it? Can they sustain it against Mercedes and Ferrari who um, have uh, facilities which, okay, Aston Martin have a new factory online now. You know, their facilities are catching up, but they're still not quite at the level of uh, Mercedes and Ferrari. And they've also just moved into that new factory. So there's going to be some potential teething issues along the way. So if they get, a, you know, a decent upgrade on the car here in Canada and uh, they get back ahead of Mercedes and they keep Ferrari behind them, then uh, that is going to be super impressive from Aston Martin. I think we'll really um, underline the job that they've done this year. But yeah, I mean, the, the other one is Ferrari. You know, we've got to talk about them, right, Katie? Because mm-hmm. week after week, they are letting their fans <laughs> down, aren't they? Um, I think that is an understatement. And it's interesting <laughs> after what was a really horrible qualifying for Charles Leclerc in Barcelona, he came off did a couple of interviews and he said, certainly something's wrong with the car. It just didn't feel right. Well, Ferrari were unable to find any physical breakdowns or issues that resulted in Leclerc's issues in qualifying in Spain. What does that mean? Was it a setup issue? Was that all on Charles Leclerc and his lack of performance? How would you quantify it? Yeah, that's a really tough one um, because the weird thing was it was different from Saturday to Sunday as well. So on uh, on Saturday, he had one specific problem with the car. I think it was in uh, left-hand corners, I think I'm right in saying. And then on Sunday, it was a completely different issue. And it was more kind of what you'd expect from the car, but just it wasn't performing very well. Uh, and they did remove the gearbox rear suspension, basically put a whole new rear end on that car. And it seemed to solve a little bit of the first problem, but it also didn't lead to a massive step forward. That car had a whole bunch of updates on it. Um, And as we saw in qualifying, Carlos Sainz made pretty good use of those upgrades. But, um, you know, sometimes when you do make changes to a car, it can either move it away from what a certain driver wants, or it can expose other issues. Um, Even if the performance overall improves, it might not improve the drivability of the car. And that's the one thing that the Ferrari seems to really lack this year is the pure drivability. We've seen in certain circumstances, I'm basically thinking of Azerbaijan qualifying, it is the fastest car, which is incredible when you think where Red Bull have been for this whole season. But Leclerc, uh, in the two qualifying sessions we had in Baku, because we had a sprint race and, and a normal race, he was ahead. Now, that that really kind of shows you the potential. This frustrating thing with Ferrari is that they just cannot get that potential at every race, at every type of circuit. It seems like certain types of corners, right hand, uh, sorry, uh, 90 degree uh, corners, you know, cars pretty good, right angle corners. But as soon as it gets to these longer sweeping corners or even some of the slower stuff, you know, it's really hard for the drivers to predict what's happening and the performance just isn't there. So, uh, yeah, another test in Montreal. Um, I've given up predicting where Ferrari are going to be. I remember earlier podcasts, uh, your Nate would say, hey, how's the Ferrari going to go? And I'd say with some confidence, oh, it'll be a good track. It'll be a bad track. I now have no idea. I'm not even going to pretend. And with the with the updates they brought in Spain, you know, that's the other thing. It, it can change the characteristics of, of where a car is quick. And, um, you know, Ferrari may have a, a slightly better car overall, but if it's really weak at, you know, certain tracks, then uh, that's still going to be pretty frustrating for the drivers. So, yeah, I don't know where we go with that. There is a good news story about Ferrari, though. Please. Uh, or not. Uh, completely unrelated <laughs> to Formula One, but they've won the Le Mans 24 Hours, which, yes. um, uh, I, uh, Katie, do you, do you watch the Le Mans 24 Hours? I mean, it's not. It's definitely not for mm-hmm. everyone, 24 Hours of Racing. Um, I, I didn't watch 24 Hours of Racing either, but I did watch bits of it, and uh, Ferrari's performance there was, was pretty impressive. Uh, there's some reasons behind the scenes to do with how they kind of... Um, stop certain teams from getting too far ahead so it would be like an f1 with red bull they'd add an extra few kilos to their car they did that to toyota but um but yeah aside from that ferrari did a remarkable job and so uh leclerc was there fred vasseur was there and also the president john elkin was there and they all saw a ferrari victory um for the first time this year uh in a kind of top tier motorsport and so i think that's a little bit of extra pressure on ferrari you know the Le Mans team can go and win. No doubt. Yeah, that's a step up, right? When you were around Charles in Spain, I mean, he's had some bad luck 
this year. I, I would not say that this is the start he envisioned or wanted whatsoever. What would you say his mental space is in right now? I think he is. I think he is quite low, um, and he's actually very good uh, um, defending the team and uh, putting a lot of the pressure back on himself and admitting to his own mistakes and being analytical of his own mistakes, being open about his own mistakes. But now you can see more and more that it's not his mistakes. And if they are his mistakes, it's because the cars put him in such a horrible position. And you can see the frustration, just frustration bubbling up. I don't think it always quite comes across in the quotes. I think he's still quite good at just limiting himself to what he's saying. But the body language is is pretty negative. And um, I think it's just because, you know, he went into last year. This time last year, even, you know, he was still a championship contender. Yeah. Um, we had our doubts by this point last year, but he was still right up there uh, with a chance to, to win the title. And really from roughly this point onwards, it all went wrong. And it's brought about a year of domination by Max Verstappen and Red Bull. And Leclerc will know from those early races uh, of 2022, remember we had a number where him and Max were fighting wheel to wheel yeah. and we thought, this is great. This, you know, it's a shame so that exciting. we don't have more drivers involved. It's a shame we don't have Lewis and George, but wouldn't it be great if we now see Max versus Charles Leclerc at the top of F1? And I think he really expected that to happen. And all of that has been whipped away through no fault of Leclerc's own. I mean, I know he made some mistakes last year, but ultimately the downward trend has been in car performance, not in driver performance. So yeah, I think uh, I think it's tough for him. Also, because what do you do? Like any other drive on the grid right now, how do you compete with Max Verstappen if you're not in a Red Bull? Because none of the other cars are quick enough. You can't, sadly. And I I, I can't imagine trying to mentally deal with that. It's going to take a, a really strong mindset, I think, for Charles Leclerc to kind of pull himself out of what would be called a funk right now, certainly. Um, and as you mentioned, it's not all on him. It's, it's certainly some of the onus has to be put on the team and the car that they're putting on track. You mentioned what it would be like to uh, compete against Max Verstappen right now. What are your expectations for his teammate, Sergio Perez, after two weekends that were, I don't want to say overall disappointing, but two qualifying, certainly, in Monaco and Spain that were disappointing for Sergio Perez? That's exactly right. It has been a very clear weakness, hasn't it, the last two races. And qualifying is when the most pressure is on. So you've got to wonder whether, whether the pressure's just got to him a little bit. Um, because if we rewind to Baku, we were talking about him as a potential title contender because what he'd shown us to that point is that while he wasn't quite on Max's level, he was able to take advantage when things went wrong for Max. And also you felt he was way closer than he's ever been before. Now it doesn't look like that. You know, it's changed a lot recently. Um, and I was in his media session in Barcelona ahead of uh, the race weekend, so on the Thursday, and he was asked about three times, do you still think you can win this championship? And of course he said yes. I mean, what else can he say, right? He has to say yes. Sure. He has to back himself. But um, yeah, now after that second race of it going wrong, because those questions were coming about, they seemed a little bit harsh, but coming about because of what had happened in Monaco and the big mistake he'd made in Q1, which had set his whole weekend back and meant he scored zero points. And um, and so, you know, you felt, well, he can answer these questions. The best way he can answer them is going out at Barcelona, a track which everyone thought was going to suit Max Verstappen uh, more than Perez anyway, and getting close or beating Max. And he was so far from that, wasn't he? So it's 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 rough. It's rough. I mean, the, the one thing in, in his uh, to his advantage maybe this weekend is that Canada is a bit more like a street track. We always talk about Checo being great on street tracks, Max. King of the know, streets. King of the streets, right? And I actually asked him about that on in that Thursday session. And he was like, eh, you know, I mean, I, I kind of see where it's coming from. I understand it. But his opinion was that, look, if you are really good on street circuits, you should be just as good on uh, on normal racing circuits because actually the street circuits are... Um, well, more difficult take, take that little bit more extra concentration exactly more difficult the walls are closer and so he felt like oh you know if i can be that close to max there then i can be that close to him everywhere but um of course monaco didn't go that well anyway so yeah it's 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 a tough one for checo right now and um i can't really see unless you know we see some bad luck for max over the next few rounds uh a way back into this championship for him because once that dies cast and it just starts spiraling downwards for a driver we've seen it so many times before in a direct uh, a, a, a direct um, championship between two teammates. We've seen it with Valtteri Bottas and Lewis Hamilton, Rubens Barrichello, Michael Schumacher, if you want to go back a few years, Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel. So many times, once the downward spiral starts, it's so hard to get out of it, especially when your competitor, your rival, is as good as Max Verstappen, and you know he's not going to make many mistakes. So, yeah, it's a tough one. I don't know. I mean, 
Checo go and prove me wrong is all I can say because I'd love <laughs> to see a championship battle. What's the terms of his deal currently? I know he signed the extension after winning Monaco a year ago, but how many more years left does he have on that deal with Red Bull? Yeah, so I believe it's to the end of next year, 2024. Okay. Um, I haven't double checked that, but I think that's just right. curious. Not yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, it's a fair question. Alluding think, to anything? No, it's a question that a lot of people are asking. Um, because uh, what kicked it off a little bit was remember Brazil last year. Uh, where um, Max refused to move over and give Checo some extra points in his fight for uh, second place in the championship. And that then uh, unearthed this uh, big controversy between the two over what happened in Monaco last year and Checo crashing and qualifying again, but actually to his advantage that time around. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so then a lot of these questions were being asked. They're like, well, this is Max's team. How can they you know, survive until the end of 2024 if these two drivers are at war? But um, I guess one way to make it easy for both sides as if as if one driver is is clearly much further ahead and then you know any kind of squabbles over things don't have quite the same impact as when they're fighting each other for a championship uh so i you know i i feel like if if checo keeps his head down he can absolutely see the end of that contract um but you know it hasn't kind of been uh you know it hasn't gone unrecognized that there is Daniel Ricciardo knocking around, very keen to get into a competitive car. And so yeah. should we end up in a situation where something does go wrong, I'm not saying it will, uh, or a situation where Red Bull no longer believe Perez is the right driver, I'm not saying that's the case at the moment because the mood music suggests otherwise, uh, they do have Daniel Ricciardo there as a potential replacement and also a really interesting experiment to see what would happen, right? I mean, the, but this is a thing though, isn't it? If, if we look at Max Verstappen and his teammates over the years, um, you know, starting with Daniel Ricciardo left because one of the reasons it seemed to be that he felt that he could not compete with Max at Red Bull. Uh, then we had uh, Pierre Gasly step up, uh, probably a bit too early, couldn't deal with it, completely underperformed compared to where we know he could be. Then Alex Albon steps up again, pretty much the same story. Uh, started off well, but just couldn't keep up the consistency. Again, probably promoted way too early in his career to be in that position, but. Ultimately, it wasn't there what was needed to compete with Max. And then Checo came in and we're like, finally, an experienced driver who's going to kind of, you know, really take take the challenge to uh, to Max. And again, same thing over time. Max has just ground him down. But I think the one constant for all this is just how good Max is. You know, yeah. like we know it's Checo. Consistency. That's it. And we know Checo is a good driver. So, you know, we, we know he is uh, among that kind of like very good F1 driver perhaps not very top tier as we found out the last couple of years, but incredibly good. And, and, you know, that's just shows you how, what level Max is on. And according to EA, uh, six best driver <laughs> currently on the grid. Okay. And who am I to disagree with that? Exactly. Uh, yeah, just, exactly. Just don't read my driver rankings from last year because it might not. <laughs> we will patiently right. be waiting for that just to stir up some drama. Um, Everybody else, teams, driver-wise, who else are you kind of keeping an eye on storyline-wise and and curious to see how they perform in Montreal? Um, I think Alpine are, are riding a little bit of a crystal wave after they got a boot up the backside from uh, Lauren Rossi in Miami, uh, where he kind of really went in hard on the team management and the way that team has been performing. And uh, they hit back with a podium in Monaco uh, and then a fairly solid result in Spain. And so two very different types of tracks decent car you hear increasingly the likes of mercedes and ferrari talking about the alpines in in conversations about where they are in the competitive order you know they, they'll say well you know we're obviously against aston martin and ferrari if it's mercedes talking but also we've got to keep an eye on alpine so i think they made 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 a good step and you know uh this is a track that i don't see any reason why it won't see the car but yeah we'll, we'll have to um wait and see um and then uh you know there's there's a number of ongoing stories up and down the grid right you know mclaren and yeah. The you know can they turn it around this year looking increasingly like maybe not you know the performance of the car isn't really where it should be there's been mistakes um you know there's there's a lot of questions about that team going forward and yet you've still got Lando Norris capable of doing qualifying performances like he did in Spain and putting it in the top three which was incredible I mean that whatever his pace rating is I think it's 91 in the EA Sports ratings pretty deserved on the basis of that um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky time for them. So, uh, they'll also be looking just to get some good points on the board because, um, yeah, if you look at the moment, uh, if you're not, um, basically Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes, Aston Martin or Alpine, uh, getting in the points at the moment is quite difficult because if all those drivers finish of those top five teams, there are no points left on the table. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's it's important for the other teams to take the chances where they can. Beautiful bow, which means only one thing is left to do, and that is to make predictions. And as the poor host that I am, I forgot to text Nate Saunders and ask him for his predictions, but he is busy interviewing Daniel Ricardo as we speak. So I wasn't expecting a text back, just a full disclaimer. You and I actually tied, if you remember from our predictions in Spain, you believed Max Lewis and Checo would be on the podium. I believed Max Fernando and Lewis would be on the podium. So you currently are at top of the table, two oh. wins, two ties, three losses, which is better than Nate and I's current records. I will text him and I'll update us obviously when we reconvene next week afterwards to react to the Montreal, to the Canadian Grand Prix. What is your predictions for this weekend? So all I said about Aston Martin, I think it's, it's, it's a race where they bounce back now, just because I'm now I'm in the lead. I'm going to do the Red Bull thing and just be a little bit conservative. So I'm going to okay. say Max Verstappen wins. All right. Fernando Alonso second, uh, Sergio Perez third. Uh, just because I, yeah, I just feel like Perez hasn't quite got it together at the moment, and Fernando uh, has had a fire lit underneath him ever since he underperformed at his home race. I think that's fair. I'm actually gonna just switch around my picks from two weeks ago. I'm gonna go with Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton P2, Fernando Alonso. P3. So he's back on the podium as he said he would be, but I'm going to go with option B, a little giddiness towards Mercedes. I'm going to be hopeful, but cautiously optimistic. We'll see. So those are our two picks. We'll get Nate's honors and update you next week. As always, I appreciate your time, your analysis. It's always so enjoyable. I won't say it's too enjoyable without Nate because I don't want him to get jealous, obviously, as he's hardly working. But we uh, will be back next week to break down all things uh, regarding the Canadian Grand Prix. Thanks for the time. Peace. Peace.